Fernando Montenegro asks, when do I use Cassandra and when do I not use Cassandra? Uh, well, that's easy enough. The first requirement has got to be scale. If you don't have a classically big data problem, if you don't have a problem of scale, you don't have a problem for Cassandra. It needs to be too big to fit on one computer to be served by a uh, single master database. If it is, then you've got a pretty good shot. Now, other things that you'll look at that'll push you towards Cassandra would be uh, high velocity updates. That's transactional data, customer data, uh, that changes a lot where you need fast answers, uh, like serving a shopping cart or uh, you know, collections of things, uh, like a, you know, a Spotify playlist would be a big example, a good example. Uh, those are sort of classical Cassandra things. If you have big data that doesn't fit on one computer and never changes, then sometimes the economics push you more in the direction of Hadoop. You don't really need a database, you need a big file server with some processing tools on top of it. But that's some, some good guidelines for Cassandra. Ryan Fowler, or at Fowler Fowler on Twitter, asks, how do I do data modeling with no referential integrity? Well, three things. Denormalize, denormalize, and denormalize. All three things are important. Uh, and seriously, that really is the answer. We're taught from a relational perspective that denormalization is somehow immoral and like uh, you know, the world's gonna fall apart if you do that. That's really not the case. In fact, when you're under scale pressure, when reads are not performing well enough in the relational world, you, you denormalize. I mean, you get there, it happens. So you just do that ahead of time. Uh, there are still cases in, uh, I'll just stick with, with Cassandra as the example here, uh, where you still do have foreign keys. Now, there are no foreign keys constraints, but you'll have one row referring to another row in some other table. That's totally fine. And with no constraints, those can get out of date. So in that case, you can, say, write a Spark job that'll go through during a low traffic time and sweep for uh, referential integrity violations and uh, come up with some compensating action uh, to do there. There are also advanced features like logged batches in Cassandra that you can do when you, you do have a few updates that can help you avoid the problem in the first place. But really, denormalization is key and kind of after the fact correction. Dharm Rajvalia asks, uh, are row-oriented relational databases, like say MySQL, really that hard to scale? Is it a myth or are there real limitations to distribute and scale such databases? Uh, well, Dharm, it, it's not a myth. Uh, there are definitely problems in scaling them. Now, this, you have to look carefully at the stories of scaling, say, MySQL. Yes, you can make distributed so-called web scale systems with MySQL. Facebook would be a good example. But by the time you get there, it's not a relational database anymore. Uh, as you scale that thing, you give ground a piece at a time. First, you give up the consistency you thought you had. Uh, then you start to denormalize. Uh, then you have to get rid of your constraints. Then you realize you can't really index anything anymore because writes are too slow. Uh, and pretty soon it becomes a, a, a weird key value store disk babysitter, and it's not even a relational database anymore. So you can get there, but uh, why not start out with a product that's designed to scale in the first place? Uh, is, is kind of how I look at it, a product that's making you make all those trade-offs explicitly rather than you sort of fighting this rear guard action against scale. So there, there really are reasons there. And on a more, uh, uh, I guess, a more technical basis there, uh, those are first going to have to do with read, or pardon me, write capacity. That's where uh, things really start to break down when you, when you can't handle write traffic on a single server anymore, when you have to shard. Uh, sharding in a relational database sometimes works very well. Often that's where life starts to get really bad. Uh, so yes, uh, those reasons are absolutely valid and what they say about scaling in relational databases is, in my opinion, true. Steve Phillip asks on YouTube, almost everyone doing distributed systems seems to accept the CAP theorem as correct, but in one of his blog posts, to which Steve links, the Michael Stonebreaker says in part, Quote, using the CAP theorem to justify giving up ACID consistency is flawed. In the real world, giving up consistency does not improve availability. Hence, you are giving up consistency in exchange for nothing. Well, uh, in a real sense, far be it for me to argue publicly with Michael Stonebreaker. He certainly is an industry luminary. And I will say, by way of sympathy with this blog post, it was written about five years, four and a half years ago, October of 2010. And if you remember, what Hacker News was like back then, 
Every day there was a new and even more ignorant blog post that made it to the front page uh, saying something about the CAP theorem or some database and the implications of the CAP theorem this way or that way. And it, it was painful, okay, it was painful. They, they clearly, the authors didn't really have a grasp on quite what the CAP theorem meant. And so in this blog post, which is five years old now, and I don't know if the authors revised his views, he's, I think, in part expressing frustration about people saying ignorant things about the behavior of databases with respect to the CAP theorem by way of a misunderstanding, and I'm very much with him there. Um, I would say, uh, other than that, that um, the probably the experience of the industry since that time has led to a pretty strong consensus that there, there really is a reason uh, to make trade-offs in either consistency or availability for the sake of becoming distributed and uh, giving up on ACID transactions for the sake of high throughput distributed database, being a high throughput distributed database is a good idea. I mean, lots of people are deploying, I'm most in touch with Cassandra, but a lot of people are deploying Cassandra in that way and they're able to build systems. Uh, and this is really a thing that's been going on for a long time, it's just been covert. I mean, globally, finance is a distributed system, uh, you know, the automated part of finance where computers are talking and uh, we don't have transactions there and we don't, we don't have uh, consistency, immediate consistency there. Um, I mean, it takes, and it's, it's not even a high throughput system either, it takes three days, but uh, you know, there's this long process by which an ACH transaction in the United States uh, takes to close, and that res that that's different transactions going on in different parts of the network. So, uh, we're I think there's definitely a consensus that that trade-off is real. Uh, what he was saying was not that the cap theorem is an invalid conclusion. Nobody is challenging that. Uh, that that looks like a, a pretty solidly proved theorem. Um, what he's saying is that it's wrong-headed. His argument was that all of these other sources of error are going to be more likely than the occasional network partition. And I would say that probably the operational experience of the NoSQL community, I'd say certainly the Cassandra community since then, uh, has been uh, the opposite of that. That partitions are even a fairly ambient condition. I mean, a, a major GC pause in a JVM, that's a partition. And you shouldn't be getting those in a well-tuned Cassandra cluster, but you know, again, kind of to, to the spirit of his post, stuff goes wrong, you don't always have things right. And that's an example of something that people don't have right. And so, you know, you're gonna miss updates through things like that. That's, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, so I, I, I would feel pretty confident at this point saying that the, the trade-offs imposed by the cap theorem obviously are absolutely true and probably push us in the right direction rather than the wrong direction in making the kinds of trade-offs uh, that, that he talks about. He rightly points out that distributed systems are a matter of trade-offs. And I think the consensus has kind of come down on the fact that, that uh, we're probably doing the right thing, uh, giving up transactions, getting performance, and getting scale in exchange. And for those cases when that's not possible or not uh, desirable, we have other options. And as engineers, that's always a good thing.